we follow the equator round to the Australian side of the world, we arrive at the group of islands and islets named in the atlases as the Gilbert and Ellis Islands. In most school atlases, they appear as little more than a group of dots. But seen from the air, they are small islands, each separated from the ocean by a reef of coral. Coral itself is a more or less compact rock formed from the limey skeletons of millions upon millions of tiny sea creatures. How coral got formed into atolls and lagoons is of great interest to the geologist, though not all are agreed about how it came about. There can be no doubt, however, about the trees. These are almost entirely coconut palms. Such trees flourish in the coral limestone soil. Outside the coral reefs, the Pacific rolls and breaks. Starfish, or coral spiders as they are sometimes called, thrive in the calmer lagoons. As do also the crayfish. For the octopus, the lagoon forms a kind of nursery till at last he becomes one of the giants of the outer ocean beyond the reef. The shores are literally alive with these interesting creatures, the hermit crabs. Their hermitages are any unoccupied shell that they can find. They're not really as fearsome as this might lead you to expect. Overhead, the birds wheel incessantly, rather like seagulls, to which these birds are related. They are terns, because of their grace in flight, sometimes called fairy terns. Sharing the airspace with them are the noddies, said to have been given their name by the sailors who first explored these islands. That was when Gilbert, the British explorer, came here in 1788. Coral and palm trees are much as they were in Gilbert's day. The people of the islands are of a mixed race. Melanesian and Polynesian. And the blending gives rise to varied types of beauty. And as with most examples of beauty, it is far from being uniform. Besides being handsome, these people are quite friendly. By our standards, most of them are poor. Yet in spite of their poverty, they have a dignity and character which many wealthier races do not possess. They listen to advice, and they profit by encouragement. Even in extreme old age, they retain their inherent dignity. None of their villages is large enough to be called a town, though they are always very pleasant in fine weather. But when it rains, in this part of the world, it really rains. Every child in the Gilberts knows how important coconuts are, and every man soon masters the art of tree climbing to get at coconuts. He also knows how to deal with them when they're gathered, and so does she. Trees are also climbed for toddy, got from deftly cut flower buds at the top of the tree, Toddy is a refreshing drink, unless it's allowed to ferment, in which case it becomes dangerously alcoholic. Nuts, when gathered, are brought to central collecting points.
Here they are husked, split open, and laid out to dry on mats made from coconut leaves. The dried flesh of the coconut is then known as copra. After packing in Hessian bags, the copra eventually finds its way to the margarine factories in Britain or America. Some may even be used for soap making. Domestic water, at least uh, palatable domestic water, is precious. In spite of tropical rains, well ca wells can and do go dry. Water has to be drawn by hand, of course. There's never any shortage of briny water, and using a canoe on it is almost second nature to the Gilbertese. Their canoes are always built without riggers. They're light. And they're portable. And easily drained, too, if the need arises. The outrigger helps speed and stability. When fitted with a sail, a boom, and a mast, the canoe converts to a sort of yacht. All very pleasant on a good day. It almost looks like a picture from a holiday guidebook, except that holiday makers don't usually come to these parts. Even with a load like this, such canoes get up quite a turn of speed, and the man in charge needs to have taut muscles Lots and lots of experience, and not a little determination. Keeping the outrigger down on the water isn't everybody's idea of a pleasure cruise. But it's all part of the skill of sailing. Just as skill is also needed if you're a fisherman from a canoe. Controlling a canoe by a single paddle is an art in itself. Even the designing and the making of the paddle is no mean accomplishment. One commodity that is always in demand among this sailing community is twine. Made from coconut fiber, it is made by hand, and it's usually a female occupation. Where it is available, nylon may replace twine for net making, but whatever the net material, that's the method of using it. Yes, the dive is part of the net gathering process. You might even use a net with a technique like this. Or your fishing might be like this if you have the tackle. Every village, however, has its fish trap. The low coral walls impound live fish as they are left behind by the receding tide. Whew. That's a clumsy method. You may think it's cruel, too, but look at this. Here's the more traditional way. Got it. The reward of a steady eye and a swift hand. Getting the catch home isn't much of a problem if you're an individualist or if you work along with other people. And notice the variety of the catch. 
Yes, boys must work and so must girls, but beauty need not go unadorned. This then is the kind of environment in which the Christian church has become established due to pioneer work by missionaries like John Williams and more recently Alfred Sad, who lost his life by Japanese occupation forces. In these days at least, the larger centers of population, churches are housed in permanent buildings. They're well attended. The church members share as best they can in the upkeep and maintenance of their churches. Yet, with the best will in the world, they cannot do it all by themselves. Wherever there is a church in these islands and islets, there is need for better facilities for educating its people and facilities for linking them together and with the world church. And all this emphasizes the importance of a trained and effective minister. Through the years, the London Missionary Society has helped forward this work. It has provided ships, the present one is the seventh of its line, to bear an honored name, a name which is familiar in churches all over the world. And wherever the John Williams sails among the Coral Islands, it witnesses to the continuity of Christian care and concern. It is the means of maintaining communication between churches and people who would otherwise be cut off and isolated. Like every other ship which plies among the coral islands, it is specially designed for shallow anchorages. Captain Harrison is the man in charge. He has radar and ship to shore radio. And along with all the usual aids to navigation, he also has devices for depth sounding and when needed, an automatic pilot. Its guest passengers frequently include both European and Gilbertese workers in the various island churches. Eritire, for example, he's a Gilbertese minister seen here on his homeward journey after one of his pastoral tours. Under the captain's guidance, the ship glides steadily towards its anchorage. And once at anchor, all hands on deck is the order. Every member of the crew knows his specialized job. Without fuss, the whale boat is slung over the gunwale. Its berth during voyages is on its stock right over the cargo hatch. The smoothness of the launching bears a tribute to the crew's discipline. And at the stern of the ship, Another boat is launched, this time a diesel-driven motor boat. This, of course, is a much heavier boat than the whale boat was. It is especially useful for ferrying goods from the ship to the shore. For a man of his years, Eritire is remarkably nimble. Frequent disembarking has accustomed him to this. So while the John Williams rides at anchor, Eritire's craft makes land. Waiting to welcome him are Tarietta, the head of a school for senior boys, and Miss Maxfield, an English missionary who devotes her considerable talents to the education of girls. 
Carrieta and the retire have much to talk about, including cement. Now, the connection between drums of cement and missionaries may not be immediately obvious, yet there is one. Resident pupils need housing in a hostel. A hostel needs a permanent building. Permanent buildings call for cement. Uh, one further fact, without the John Williams, the cement wouldn't easily be made available. And the same thing is true in the case of flour. Flour made from wheat is necessary to balance pupils' diet in a place where the home produce is almost entirely coconut flesh and fish. Again, without the John Williams, it wouldn't be likely to be available. The ship's boat is easily run ashore and made fast, all ready for the unloading. Like the good headmaster that he is, Tarietta believes in the value of practical work for boys. And when it comes to this kind of practical work, the boys appear to agree with him. Iritaya has chartered one of the few lorries to be found in the Coral Islands for the last stage of the journey. Willing hands make light work. And eventually, the working party moves off, Iritaya proud to be a part of it. <laughs> no, no, it isn't up to motorway standards, but in a region where cement is precious, mechanical road making is almost out of the question. To Iritaya, it's all part of the day's work, the jolting included. The whole population recognizes what he does for them. That welcome banner, the surge of the children, they're all tokens of love and affection. Iritaya is back among his own people. Naturally, the senior school pupils must be paraded for inspection. Formal welcomes over, Iritaya is able to join his own family, uh, to their obvious delight. The two girls, by the way, are now trained nurses. Over a family cup of tea, Iritaya tells them of the islands and islets he has just visited, and they possibly remind him of the local public rejoicing to which guests will come from far and wide. The party has been arranged by his colleagues. The wheat flour cakes show how special the occasion is. And because this is the Coral Islands, the rejoicing must include a Thanksgiving dance. This is as traditional in the Coral Islands as a mayor's procession would be in Britain. Uh, and it serves roughly the same purpose. The decorations, the dance routines, they've all come down from pagan times, but their significance seems to have been lost on the way. It's all very intense for the dancer. It's all very attractive to spectators, some of whom will go to almost any height to get a good view. Soon, however, Eritaya must get down to work. As a minister, one of his duties is to write material for the press, and the press, in this context, means the only printing press for religious information in the whole of the Gilbert Islands. 
it's always kept busy. And that's just as it should be. For as more and more people become more and more educated, the need for effective printed matter becomes obviously greater and greater. And after printing comes publishing, this being one of the valuable services of the mission house. However, night must fall. More beautifully here than in many places. And new days must dawn. And with one of them, Eritrea's journeying must start all over again. His new tour involves a lot of preparation. It musters a lot of interest and some help among his church members. When Minister and Cargo are aboard the John Williams, the motor launch is winched in. Slung to its place, and made fast in its cradle. Then, everything having been made secure, the John Williams gets underway, saluted by other craft as it speeds Eritrea on to his next rendezvous. There, having judged the tide exactly, the boat brings him very close inshore. Very close inshore, indeed. Not quite so large a reception committee this time. All the same, as befits their office, the deacons come first. Then introductions completed, all move off towards the nearby village. It's a village with all the usual features. Its thatched buildings are laid out according to a plan. The largest of them is the Maniaba, the center from which the village's community life is regulated. Eritai is certain to call here to pay his respects to the elders of the Maniaba. They are in effect the councillors and magistrates of the village. His main interest, however, will be in the 101 details of the church's life. Everything from facilities for communion to the state of the church membership role will be considered. His visit is obviously a popular occasion. Not in many places does the minister and his deacon sit together on a hardened floor to take stock of the church welfare. Here it's the right thing exactly the right thing. And one of the matters to be discussed is the repair of the church roof, which means thatch and volunteers for laying it. A job for experts. All the members look forward to the day when they will have a permanent building for their church. And for this they are prepared to sacrifice. Now what can they give? Just a little copra from their very meager store. Yet this is genuine sacrifice. Here's the village version of the offertory will now be received. Glad giving by an appreciative people. And even the children want to be in on the enjoyment. Encouraged by their church, the parents of the villages are a people with a special interest in their children's welfare and what active children they are. Lacking public playgrounds, they make do with whatever comes to hand. If you can't make your own sports tackle, you go without. 
And mentioning playground, what about this? There'll be no showers in the pavilion to follow this game. A dip in the lagoon, perhaps. Anyhow, they're all sure to be spruced up in time for school, where lessons are sometimes very exciting. However, the John Williams awaits, and Derry Tyre has at least one more call to make. Wherever its journeyings are needed, the crew of the John Williams stands ready for the task. The purpose of Derry Tyre's visit to this island is to call at the Ministerial Training Centre, where, among the students, is his own son. Being prepared with others.